Well, we're going to bring on former Philly and current CSN Phillies analyst, Marlon Anderson. Marlon, how you doing today? Hey, doing pretty good, guys. How's it going? We're doing okay, Marlon. We are uh, enjoying the Chase Utley show from afar, and uh, I guess we'll start with that. The, the Your reaction to the what took place on Tuesday night, the not one but two curtain calls and all that. Well, I, I love, I, you know, for me it's two separate things, and I, I have to separate them to be able to talk about them. Uh, the ovation at the beginning of the game when he stepped into the box and <clears throat> taking his bow and, you know, the fans honoring him and him, you know, showing respect to the fans, I, I loved it. I, I think, you know, it's well-deserved for a player like that that was in the middle of all the great things that the Phillies did in the last few years. And, you know, I, I think uh, people – you know, sometimes, you know, you, you get mixed up with the players. And, you know, this time of day, you can see your favorite player anytime you want to. So you usually stick with those players. What I was disappointed in, and I'll say this, is just uh, standing ovation after the home run. Like, I wasn't a big fan of it. If I'm sitting in that field dugout and I'm at home playing and my, my fans are cheering for an opponent, even if it is Chase Utley, you know, I'm a little disappointed. But the bottom line is, he had a personal great day. I mean, he swung the bat well, had those two home runs, and you have to compliment that. But I didn't want all the cheers in the stands when uh, the Phillies guys and that dugout are working really hard and trying to get a job done as well. And then last night, of course, then it's the opposite side for him. They give him polite applause to start the game, but 0 for 5, two strikeouts. Uh, <laughs> Phillies fans seem to be okay with that. We'll clap for you, but don't beat us. <laughs> no, I think so. I mean, that, that, the, the first night, I think it was that it was a two-one game at the time, and Velasquez gave up the home run to him. And you know, for me, I, you know, the, the cheering and ovation. If I'm sitting in that dugout and I'm actually out there competing and working hard and trying to win this game, it's a little disappointing. It's unfortunate. And uh, you know, just to point out what Chase said after the game, like how the fans have always been supportive and they've been so great to him personally and to the teams he's been on. And you know. That is the reason that I didn't like the applause because you have to be loyal to your home team if you're a home team fan. Once the player is going somewhere else, like you have to be dedicated to your your, your team if you're a really true Philly fan. Uh, Marlon Anderson's with us here on the Sports Bash. So, uh, what Chase Utley did was illustrate how the ball can jump out of Citizens oh, Bank yeah. Park. And last night, uh, Carlos Gonzalez, with, or Adrian Gonzalez, excuse me, with not one, but two long balls, uh, that illustrates two things. One, that, you know, he's hitting one, two, three, four, fifth in the lineup, and he can do that on a regular basis as he seems to be heating up. And then, two, uh, Jake Thompson looked like he struggled with his location. Yeah, he definitely struggled with his location. And, and again, I think I, I said before, they even called uh, Thompson up, that you have to keep it in perspective. He's 22 year old yet, and he's out there facing big leaguers. He's in his, uh, two of his first three starts. He's faced one of the best offenses, one of the most veteran teams that understand hitting in the big leagues, and they've taken advantage of him. Marl, I wanted to ask you about Thompson because this is the second straight night a Phillies pitcher has given up five runs in a start. And I don't know, is, is it the heat that's getting to them? Is it the length of the season? Because it really feels like when watching Thompson and Velasquez the last two nights, I'm getting the sense that they have their moments, and you're like, wow, that was a really good pitch. Wow, that was a really good at bat. And then other moments where it just seems like there's a little bit of fatigue or you know, is, is there something going on with these guys as the season has gotten to them? It's a normal marathon of a big league season, and I think you have a lot of young guys doing it for the first, maybe the second full season of their careers or of, or of their lives, and they're going to struggle sometimes. It, it, it is physical. It's mental. It's all of those things. It's fatigue. It's, you know, travel across the country. It's a lot of those things, and it's one of those things that you have to learn to adjust to in the big leagues and learn about the marathon and not the sprint. Sometimes we can come out of the box fast, but we got to understand that in this marathon, you have to be very precise in when you work out, how you work out, you know, why you work out. Like, it, there's a lot to be learned in the big leagues, and it's just not thing on the field is the off the field stuff that can affect your on the field play. But these guys are young. You got to understand that. 20, they have so many 22, 23, 24 year olds that are going through this for the first full season, maybe the second full season, and it's just going to get to them sometimes. And they're not going to be better in teams, good teams, teams with uh, as deep a lineup as the Dodgers have. They're not going to beat those teams on a consistent, regular basis. And you just have to accept that and understand that this rebuilding process that the Phillies is going on, going through right now. It is a process, and you can't rush a process when he's talking about big league baseball. Speaking of not rush, the Phillies decided to move Aaron Nola to the 60-day DL. 
de facto ending his season. And it seems like the Phillies are being extra cautious with these guys. There's talk the Phillies could be shutting down Vincent Velasquez after he gets to maybe 125, 130 innings. I want to get your thoughts on observing young pitchers grow because you were a hitter, so you got to see guys as they came along over the years from the hitter's perspective. I want to know your thoughts on a young pitcher developing and not wanting to rush them along. Well, uh, I'm from the school of you pitch and that's how you build up innings. I mean, saving a guy, I'm not of that belief. I was like, push him because eventually you're going to have to push him to that max. Now, teams are being more cautious with their pitching because it's young pitching they hadn't been around. And it's so obvious on a team like the Phillies is because they have, you know, four guys that are young and that you need to limit their innings. And so it's like it makes it kind of, you know, the, the subject that you have to talk about because it's so many of them that you have to cut down their innings and try to limit them. And, you know, they've had a little injuries and they're coming back and you have to protect these guys long term. I totally get it. I understand it. You know, you have to do this. But we're talking about it because, there's so many of them on this team and on this roster, and it's just a part of what this organization is right now. Marlon Anderson's with us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN-FM. You can watch him tonight on Phillies pre and post on TCN, which, of course, stands for the Comcast Network. Phillies game on TCN or the secondary channel because some other sport with guys that run around and tackle each other is on the uh, mothership, if you will. But Phillies and Dodgers again tonight, Marlon, right? And uh, we're talking also a little bit about their play in the field. Josh and I were to open the show. Um, Uh The one time I really heard booze last night was in the sixth inning, bases loaded, ball to right, and Michael Franco doesn't tag up and score. What happened on that play in your mind, and who was at fault? Well, I'll tell you this. They're they're down by three runs, and – the right fielder has a great arm. Reddick. Now, he's getting behind that ball. He's behind the ball. He's back. You're not going to score definitely. You don't know where he's throwing the ball. He's, he's throwing the ball in. By the time you look and see he's throwing it to second base, it's too late. You can't judge that. Again, I, that base running, to me, that's not a blunder. It's one of those things that I don't want the guy to play to have a better at bat to make me be able to get in ho- at home easy or hit a deep fly ball to where there's no chance he can throw into the plate. He was, you know, borderline there. He could have thrown the ball to the plate easily. I don't think you rinse him out at home plate with the bases loaded and nobody out. That was a, that being the first out. Well, that naturally segues then to the next batter who flew out to center field, and then Peterson. In that one, even I could see that it was shallow enough, and Peterson's momentum's kind of carrying him in. And you know, and, and I don't know. They said on the broadcast that you know Juan Samuel says that ultimately the decision rides with him and whether or not to send the guy or not. And so on the second play, they didn't send him, and then of course uh, they got no runs out of that inning. But there definitely were boos after both of those plays. Yeah, and th- and those boos for me, that's. Normal, they can do that. That's fine. But if you're in that dugout and you understand the game of baseball, you have to have better at bats. There, that's what dictated you have to make those bad decisions, those tough decisions. When you're down by three runs already, I want the guys to have better at bats. Again, you got younger players, you got guys that are not used to driving in runs. They were up at the plate at that time, and they they weren't able to get the job done. So for me, I'm focusing on that more than the base running because to me, the base running. It wasn't glaring, it wasn't a blunder, it wasn't anything crazy. It was just that the situation didn't dictate you to have to be able to take a chance there because if he gets thrown out of the plate by two feet there and he's out, it's the wrong play and everybody's going to boo and go crazy as well. So for me, I don't mind that. I just want the guys to have better at bats, learn how to drive in runs, especially when the guy's at third base and less than two outs. And one of the guys that uh, seems to have go back and forth between great at bats and then what are you thinking is Odubel Herrera. And I know there's been some scuttlebutt that maybe the Phillies would even be thinking about shipping him out while he has value. Uh, what's your stance on Odubel Herrera right now and, and his growth process? And do you think that the Phillies are thinking, well, look, maybe we'll move on from him while he still has value? Um, they can. I don't I don't agree with it. I like Odubel. I think he has a lot to offer. And even in his aspect, he's been you know, he has two years above double A, and he made the all-star team this year. There's a lot of upside to what he's doing. And even if he doesn't have upside, if you can get the consistent play that you've gotten out of him right now, you're going to be happy with the player. The problem with the Phillies is they don't have enough complimentary players or veteran guys around that's going to have those good at-bats that allow the young players to grow a little bit and make some mistakes and not being so glaring. 
everything they do now is so glaring with these young guys. I mean, we're talking about Herrera. He's in 285, 280, or whatever it is. Yep, you're right, he's the team. But we have to talk about it because as a team in whole, they're just not producing runs and they're not doing what they need to do. But if he's on a different team, if he, say if he's on the Dodgers, they can put him in that lineup. He's not a focal point. He's not a guy you got to worry about. He's able to go out there and hit 280 as a young guy and is looked at as a great thing. So we have to keep it in perspective and do look at – what it actually is. He has two years above double A. He was a rule five guy. I'm liking what I see out of him. And he should get more consistent as he gets more at bats, as he gets more age on him, as he gets more years in the big leagues underneath his belt. So the Marlon Anderson of CSN Phillies, part of the pregame and postgame analysis. Marlon, I want to ask you about another young hitter, Tommy Joseph. He's actually averaging a home run for every 14 at bats, which is ninth highest rate in all major leagues. I mean, this is a guy who was kind of unheralded coming into the season, and he's come up, and I think he's done an admirable job. I mean, Marlon, he only has 226 plate appearances, but he has 16 home runs, and he has a slugging percentage of 509. I want to ask what your perception of him is, because it seems like when he got up here, he got hot, then he got cold. You know, he started to kind of adjust and figure things out, but it seems like he's coming out on the other side pretty well here. Well, you you can look at, again, a guy who hadn't had much many at-bats above double A. He's getting his first time in the big leagues, getting consistent at-bats. Gotten 200. That's a great rate of home runs, and he will grow as a, as, a, as a hitter as well. I mean, you like a lot of the things you've seen out of a lot of these hitters. He, he's going to be okay. It, will he be able to keep that pace up throughout his career if the adjustments are being made to him? Like, you, you don't know. But right now what he's doing is good. You like the player. You like to see the potential of – uh, him having an opportunity to play in the big leagues every day and get all of the bats at first base. You look forward to that. I mean, he's a guy that should definitely won that lineup. But, you know, we, we have to, you know, let him grow, let him keep growing, let him keep making adjustments because pitchers are truly making adjustments to him. And I think uh, I spoke to him, you know, a few weeks back when I was in town, and that's what he said. He's like trying to make the adjustments after they make the adjustments to him and but trying to still do what you do well. It, it's, a, it's a tough balance for a young kid. And just – being able to talk to you know a guy like Ron Howard and the veterans around that they do have, I think helps him. He seems like a pretty cerebral guy, that pretty smart, and he makes pretty good adjustments. Just and there's going to be some ups and downs in young players that you just can't ignore, or, or you have to ignore sometimes to allow them to just you know go out there and try to get better. You mentioned the name of the guy I was going to ask you about next, Ryan Howard. He has been smoking hot since the All Star game, and it seems like. You know, even though he's not the Ryan Howard of old, we're seeing the power come back in the bat, and it seems like with his success at the plate, you know, he's been more jovial, he's been more happy, and it seems to be contagious to run the locker room. No, it, it is, and he, you talk about again, he's a guy that he's hitting the home run every, I think, fourteen point seven, fourteen point something that bat well this year, and the track record speaks for itself. Early, he struggled so bad that they had to make an adjustment. They used Tommy Joseph. You know, he, he brought that upon himself because he didn't hit well enough average-wise, but, you know, he was still hitting the ball out of the ballpark. But, you know, I would love to see him get a chance to, you know, somebody to make some way make it through waivers before the uh, August 31st go somewhere with an American League team and be a DH for, you know, a playoff run somewhere. I think that would be great for him personally. I think, you know, maybe he brings somebody back to the organization, maybe not, but it's just the fact that him having an opportunity to be able to go somewhere else and have a chance to win. Marlon, let's wrap up with pitching uh, because last night Jake Thompson, 103 pitches, uh, it, he went through five, but uh, for the ninth straight game, a Philly starting pitcher hasn't gone at least seven. They'd be even thrilled with six. You know, the Phillies have played eight straight games without a starter logging six innings, and that ties a team record from 1999. Like, is this young rotation just toast because of injuries in that time of the season? Well, injuries and first time any of them thrown this many innings besides uh, Helixson, yeah, you're getting tired of dog days, the travel of the big leagues, you're going back and forth. Yeah, they, they're getting tired. And not to make an excuse for them, they're playing some pretty good teams right now. The Dodgers offense that they've had to face for, you know, two out of the last three series, you know, the Cardinals that are coming in, these are teams that are primed for the playoffs, making the push, hitters that are, uh, have some veteran hitters that make adjustments and, you know, get you in the hole sometimes. So they lineups you have to, like, grind it against day after day after day. And, you know, I think that's why Helixson is so important to this lineup. He hadn't pitched, you know, 
great lately, but you know he's a guy that can eat up some innings because sometimes you get this part of the year, young Jack guys just can't get out there and do what they were doing early in the season, where they were you know throwing six, sometimes seven, and eight innings in the start. And Frank Herman was the veteran reliever added last night, and he tossed a scoreless inning, two strikeouts, so some different faces in the bullpen. How about the starter tonight? We'll finish by asking about that. Jared Eikhoff goes tonight for the Phillies. It's a rookie right-hander for the Dodgers. Ross, Ross Striping, what do you think you'll get out of those guys? Again, young guys late in the season, I, I, I think we'll see some runs on both sides. And, you know, I, I like Eikhoff. I like what he brings to the table. He's a bulldog. He competes. But we're going to see if you're going to hit your spots with your fastball on the way. You're going to hit your spots in. You're going to throw your off-speed pitches and mix them up and keep them off balance and also get swings at it. So it, it's a lot that he can do to try to be consistent. He's a guy that he has pretty good stuff. He can use it. But every night when you get out there, how are you going to be? How are you, you, you touch on your curveball? So, you know, it's, it's a lot of things that he has to offer. I, I, I like the kid a lot. I think he's going to go out and compete and hopefully give them a chance to at least sacrifice, well, at least get one of these games out of this three-game series. Well, let's see if they can get one under three hours and 23 minutes. It was 3.33 <laughs> for Tuesday night, 3.23 last night. They're getting in the right direction for you, Marlon, because I know you don't like those marathons, baby. Let's let's keep this thing going. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Let's make it a little, quick, a little, little bit quicker tonight if you can. Marlon Anderson, Phillies pre and post. You can watch him tonight. You know who your co-host is? Uh, Marshall tonight, I think. Oh, boy, Marshall Harris. Don't call him Oliver. Marshall Harris, Marlon Anderson on TCN, 6.30, the pregame show on TCN. And then, of course, right after the final pitch, you can watch him for all the analysis. And don't ever forget, Josh, the great postgame plus. Some of the great analysis oh, comes to that, too. Hey, Marlon, thanks so much for being with us again. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it.